Welcome to episode 305 of the Bonfire Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Morgan, a.k.a. Bon Diesel, and this week we'll be talking about Starfield's Shattered Space DLC, Ubisoft possibly being sold, Larian's next game and when it may come out, and a whole bunch more uh, legitimately. Before we get started, subscribe to the Bonfire Gaming Podcast on your favorite podcast app and leave a review on Spotify or iTunes. Or subscribe to the Bond Diesel YouTube channel to get all of my videos, including this podcast. Thank you to everyone who supports as YouTube members and Twitch subscribers. If you're interested in supporting this podcast and all of my other content, please check out the links in the show description. If you have your own topics, questions, or feedback, please be sure to let me know in my Discord, in the YouTube comments, or hit me up on social media as at Bond Diesel or at the bonfire let's get into the gaming news let's start off with xbox we have the starfield shattered space dlc release with a whopping open critic of 58 um i have thoughts about that um if you're here and you've been here you probably know i like starfield a lot um i have a lot of opposition um, not necessarily to the criticism of the game. I think a lot of, uh, I think some of the criticism is is really fair. Um, it's not a perfect game. It's very dated. Um, it can be buggy, especially depending on the platform you're playing on. Um, it's got stilted animations. I, I can't imagine there's a single motion capped animation in this game. Uh, it all appears to probably be handcrafted and at scale you know, maybe not, uh, maybe not the best animations we've ever seen, uh, at least from like character faces and uh, motions and stuff. I, I think some of the stuff is actually okay. The reloads and, you know, some of the, the more minor uh, animations are, can be okay. But uh, this open critic score 58 is, is tough. Now it's worth considering, I believe this is on 11 reviews, not that many people have reviewed it. Uh, and there's a handful of reviews that are given at legit. And I think like ones and twos out of five, or, you know, what would be the equivalent of a two to four out of 10. Um, and, and then there's a few that are, are much higher on it. I would say most are kind of in the like seven ish range. Um, but those low ones really hurt it because there's so few. Um, my own opinion, if I had to score the Shattered Space DLC, I did a whole like kind of review video on it, um, but I didn't score it I, as a whole package. I'd give it like a seven. I think that's like a solid, you know, it, it's not revolutionary. It's not Starfield 2.0. It's, it's not, you know, Phantom Liberty, uh, for Starfield. Uh, it's just a solid little DLC. It probably should have been closer to maybe 20 bucks. I believe it was 30 or 35. And that was probably too much. I, that is supposedly some of the feedback uh, in my discord you know someone was saying that a lot of the feedback is that it's too expensive and, and that's fair for sure um i know i saw the steam feedback uh which has a i believe a very negative uh, uh score on there um and at least in the opening hours or the first day or so uh, a bunch of those really negative reviews uh, literally had people saying that they hadn't played the game i um I think Steam reviews are basically useless. Um, I, I think that the general kind of like negative, neutral, positive rating that games get, um, it's one of those things where I think when it's when a game is very positive, I think that's notable. Uh, if you see a game that has that rating, it probably is really good. Um, the problem is there's so many games on there that have been uh, you know, for lack of a better term, kind of intentionally uh, you know made to look bad even if the games are fine um i i think my issue is, is even in the open critic score is seeing scores i was like a two out of five for one um at least for me and obviously it's subjective those reviewers can do whatever they want i've never heard of the outlets that gave it those really those scores i also don't know every outlet out there maybe their giant outlets are very respected if you're given something a score that low I would say you're indicating that this not only did you not like it or do you not think it's good, but it like doesn't work like it's not uh, playable or it's 
uh, maybe not even technically, maybe it's just so bad that you can't even stand to play it and you don't suggest anyone else does. And maybe that's the, I, I didn't read every review. I don't have time for that. Um, and maybe that is the opinion. Uh, th that's the thing about subjective things. It's, you know, you, you can't really qualify things like that. My issue comes with how uh, I, I think, you know, uh, I believe like Paul Tassi at Forbes, who I pretty vehemently disagree with almost everything that that guy says. I think he gave it like a 6.5 out of 10 or something like that's fair. You know, I, I'm only saying a seven, maybe a seven, five, um, you know, a, a six and a half, a six score is I can see that for sure. Like, yeah, it's there. There's some cool stuff in it, but it didn't really grab me. I'm not really, you know, I'm not grabbed by it. Right. Um, the same as, and as much as I will down these reviews that are as low as, you know, un, you know, five or under, which I, I think is silly, but, um, I also think, I, I believe I saw a 10 out of 10 this deal. I, I think that's a bit much as well. Like, I think that's uh, equally silly. The same as when the game came out, the base Starfield game. Uh, you know, I, I think that some of the reviews I saw that gave it like extremely bad reviews, um, were really silly and, I think there's other things at play there. Um, I will also say that it is strange that there were outlets that gave Starfield a 10 out of 10, like some fairly notable ones too. Like I love Starfield. I think it's so good. It's, I think it's a great game. I also recognize that it's like very dated in a ton of ways that people care about um, and that the things it does well aren't really appreciated by the majority of gamers or, or, or the, a lot of gamers don't even know this, the things that Starfield does well, or at least the things that does well, in my opinion. So when it comes to the Shattered Space DLC, um, I think it's nice. It's it's more Starfield. And like I said in my review video, if you like Starfield, this DLC is good. You'll like it. You'll feel like me, probably a seven or eight out of ten. Uh, it's a more focused experience. There's a little more depth to the conversations and the interactions and things like that. Uh, there's definitely some things it seems like they've kind of picked up on the feedback of the game in general, implemented it into this DLC. You know, we have some improvements there. And then there's still tons of things that are exactly the same that people don't like about the base game. It's, I don't think people should expect at any point in Starfield's life, uh, life cycle, at least not from Bethesda, for there to be like a, a Starfield 2.0. We're not going to suddenly get a game that has, you know, these cinematic cutscenes and this, you know, hyper realistic motion captured facial animations and, and body animations and these like extremely elaborate cutscenes and uh and, and this like a whole new innovated conversation system and and all these things. Like that's probably not gonna happen. Like I, I think like I saw people, a lot of the criticism I saw uh, from, you know, supposed Starfield fans. Uh, there's an interesting thing where the Starfield subreddit it seems like it's like mostly inhabited by people who kind of hate Starfield, which is fine. That's, you know, people need a place to gather. It kind of reminds me of the the Last of Us 2 uh, subreddit, um, which was literally taken over by people who hated the game. Um, uh, but in there, I, I saw some of the conversation and some of the feedback was basically like, well, it was kind of strange because so much of the feedback was, well, they didn't do this thing that they never said they were going to do. There were people mad that there weren't new ship parts. There weren't new, you know, these various things about the game that at no time did Bethesda ever say anything like they were going to do new things with that. Um, it'd be cool if they did. I wish they would have. Or if they shadow dropped it, that would have been really, really great. Um, but they didn't. And, and this... You know, this is their first DLC, but I, I think that maybe there was an expectation that this was like going to be some big blowout patch for Starfield. And instead, it kind of seems like they've been releasing like fairly significant updates for the last year. So instead of saving all of those updates for one huge patch in uh, in in this month or, or in this patch, you know, those things have been coming out incrementally over the last 12 months. Um, like they could have saved the, the rev eight, you know, car 
for this patch uh, and it would have seemed like a bigger deal. They could have saved some of the other various things they've done, the creation uh, mods thing and, and all that, uh, the creation kit even. They could have saved all of that stuff to release all at once, um, but they but they didn't. And thank goodness, like I'm glad they released those things earlier. So I think the feedback on this is interesting. I mean, the Open Critic being 58, I mean, I guess I am saying that you know, I, I think if you weren't grabbed by this, but you think it's fine, a six out of 10 is fair. I mean, a six out of 10 is still good. That's still, a, you know, uh, yeah, that's fine. It, the, the way I talk about scoring games is it's it's a recommendation score where if you say like 10 out of 10 or even nine out of 10, you're basically saying like everyone should play this game. And if you give it like a seven or eight, you're, you're basically saying like, yeah, most people should play this game. Um, you know, but not everyone's going to be in love with it. Right. And then you give like a six or, you know, a, a, you know, a five or, you know, I guess a six or a seven uh, in that range. And you're more saying like, if this is your thing, you'll probably like it. If this isn't your thing, you probably won't. And that's kind of where I stand with the DLC. So um, I, I don't know. I, I was a little frustrated that there were some people who were posting like, I want to like this DLC, but it's so buggy and stuff. And and, and that's always such a tough subject because it's like maybe the most subjective part of all of this. Like I'm playing on PC. I have a decent PC uh, and it's worked fine. I've maybe, I maybe had to reload something once and it might've been something I did, or it could have been one of my mods I'm using um, that caused the issue. Um, it does sound like people uh, on series X are having some more issues. Uh, that could be two things. It could be one. Um, it's just the cache is filling up and it just, you know, they maybe need to restart more often, which isn't something you should have to do. I understand that. Um, also, them adding in the the mod store into the console, uh, the, the, that is just going to cause issues uh, that you may not see on, you know, even the equivalent PC for various reasons. So it sucks that people are having a bad experience technically, um, but I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's getting a little more hate than it really should. Um, but that's pretty subjective, and, and I'm definitely biased uh, in various ways, uh, in multiple ways, I guess. But um, overall, I think it's a good first effort, and I really hope that there's more DLCs. I believe the rumors and even some vague statements from Bethesda is that there will be. Um, and I believe at one point there was even mention of them um, trademarking uh, uh, the, the Starborn name. Uh, and then that led to a lot of speculation that they may do a DLC just for the Starborn. Um, if you haven't played or you're not very far into it and you don't know what that is, I, I guess I won't discuss it deeply because I don't want to ruin that for you. But um, it would be really, really interesting for them to get deeper into that. I guess that's what I'll say. So Shattered Space DLC, I like it. If you like Starfield, you probably will too. If you didn't like Starfield and you think this is going to bring you back, I don't think that's what this DLC was for, and or at least that's not what it's probably going to do. So, that's my uh, that's my that's my shtick on it. Uh, there was a quote uh, during uh, the Tokyo Game Show during uh, I believe an interview with Yoshi P, who's uh, the one of the main uh, people over there at Square Enix, uh, and they said that uh, Fantasy uh, Final Fantasy 16 port is coming for Xbox, uh, but basically said they couldn't share anything else about it. So it exists. Uh, and we'll have to wait and see how long it is till it actually comes out. Um, uh, again, this is another one of those. This is purely just a uh, a contractual deal thing. <laughs> um, it's it, that has been such an interesting subject uh, to kind of go off of it uh, because it's very likely Final Fantasy VII, the remake, and uh, the the more recent. Um, of course, I can't remember right now. The the more recent. Uh, the second part of the remake for Final Fantasy VII um, uh, is likely under a very long contract as well to only be on PlayStation uh, and PC eventually. Um, that There's still people talking about like Wukong, where at least from what I've been able to gather, like uh, Wo Long, Wukong, you know, Dynasty, whatever, it is under an exclusivity deal with Sony. Like it seems like, you know, Xbox has basically come out and said it twice. Uh, various other, you know, insiders and stuff have said it and kind of staked their whole reputation on it. Um, and instead, it's really strange how you see people kind of dismissing that and spreading what is a pure rumor that 
it's the Series S is the only reason it's not out there. There's been a lot of discussion in the last week about, you know, why aren't you, know, and it was partially started by um, supposedly Xbox is working with some marketing firms to basically get information from studios about like, why aren't your games coming to Xbox? At least that's how it's been portrayed. That's not really true because there's almost zero games not coming to Xbox unless there's exclusivity deals. Um, but but that's what started the conversation and there's still people spreading this like what is a from what i can tell a pure rumor that the series s is the problem for wukong um and dismissing what seems to be all but verified information about a deal between sony and, and that studio it's weird it gets in the console war stuff which which i hate even though i maybe participate more in it than i should um but this thing with Yoshi P and Square Enix, like like Square Enix has been pretty vocal about like, hey, these exclusivity deals, they 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 aren't really working for us. <laughs> like like we're not selling enough. That said, Square Enix is literally known for never feeling like any amount of sales is enough. So maybe there's more to it than that. But we will have to wait and see. I would guess we'll get Final Fantasy 16 for Xbox probably next year. 2025. Uh, and then lastly for Xbox, we have a, a 90 minute stalker to uh, game development documentary. I watched all of it um, on kind of the side. Um, I uh, have done a lot of, uh, I still to this day, um, keep a, like a extremely close eye on the war in Ukraine. I've um, found that conflict to be very interesting. And I think that it's a pretty impactful situation uh, and that, uh, any big developments there uh, very well could be pretty um, uh, consequential for a lot of other people in the world. Um, so I try to keep an eye on it. Um, and out of just curiosity to a point, I, I can't lie. Um, and, and seeing the story about how Stalker 2 um, has continued to be made and the conditions that they're in has been really interesting. They talk about how for, you know, a month prior to the war, the, the full scale war beginning, um, they had buses parked at their studio with drivers manning them uh, 24 seven uh, ready to go in case the war kicked off. And then it did. And they they utilized that plan to get out and um, and, and try to, you know, save their families, <laughs> but also continue making their game, which they've done, I believe, mostly in Poland. Uh, from what I can tell, it seems like they still are doing some stuff in Ukraine. Um, that that war has stabilized to a point where you know most of the war is happening in the eastern part of the country and the southern part, um, with their main cities like Kiev um, still being you know being relatively peaceful. Um, and uh, it seems like they're still doing some work there, but they also have you know a, some devs who went to the military and are fighting there. Um, they didn't mention it. So maybe it's not true. I, I remember at one point there was mention that maybe one of their devs had actually um, deceased, had actually been killed in the conflict. Um, they didn't, I don't think they mentioned that at any point. So maybe that wasn't true. Uh, but still, it's crazy that, you know, they have these game devs who are no longer working on the game because they are, you know, participating in the war in some capacity. It's, pretty wild so i'm really excited for that game to come out um i i am almost, i'm likely just gonna buy it as a show of support for that studio even though i will be able to play it on um game pass um i may just give away a code or something so i can feel like i'm not uh, completely um you know not helping them out but Really cool documentary. Uh, I suggest checking it out. Uh, be ready for subtitles, though, because it's almost entirely in Ukrainian. Moving over to PlayStation, uh, Jason Schreier, who we're, we'll talk about a couple times today. Uh, he's doing the rounds for a new book. Uh, said during one of the shows he was on that uh, Horizon 3 is probably a lot further out than most people think. Um, uh, the Horizon Forbidden West came out a few years ago at this point. It has its... You know the 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 patented playstation remaster coming uh for it um and so you know people were probably expecting like oh okay maybe late this gen they'll release a, a third game um but his he's pretty vague about it 
but it, it, to me, it seems like there's a pretty good chance this may that may be like a next gen game. Um, so if you want to know when Horizon 3 is going to come out, think about like 2028, 2029, and then think about whatever the biggest game is coming out then and PlayStation is going to release it on the same day. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, the, the first two games have been released. I forget what games they were, uh, but the first two games were released at like on the exact same day as like mo- like other super legendary games. And there's at least some blame put on that for why the, the franchise hasn't maybe been as successful as it could have been. Uh, there's also, you know, maybe there's reasons in the game for it, but uh, it's just kind of a funny little thing. So. Uh, we also had uh, an interesting story that popped up this week about giant ads in the background of the PlayStation Home UI, uh, and and PlayStation's now saying it was a bug. Uh, so basically, on their like uh, you know like their home screen UI, when you scroll between games, there's like a background image of the game or something that pops up. Uh, well, there was an update that happened, and the and that background image was replaced by ads. Um, they fixed it. It's gone. Um, the, they came out and said, like, oh, yeah, that was a bug. There is the tiniest part of me that's like, was well, it a bug? Or were you guys like maybe testing something and something from that test build made it into the live build and maybe something got released a little too early? Um, it was kind of funny because Xbox catches a lot of crap for when they have a big new game come out or there's something coming to their platform that they want everyone to know about. The first when you start up your Xbox, the first thing you see is an ad, a big full screen ad. You hit one button that goes away um, every time it happens. Tom Warren and, and everyone else makes a writes an article about it. Like, oh, look at what they're doing. And it's like, I, I guess it's annoying. Uh I there's a lot of people who are really upset about the fact that there's like ads on the home screen of the Xbox. I've literally never noticed one. Um, I I don't know. I'm I'm, maybe I'm such an X bot. Maybe I'm so biased. Maybe I've just been on the platform long enough that like, it just, I don't even think about it or I don't notice it. Um, But it was kind of funny uh, that the attitude about it was very different, Uh, but we'll, We'll see if that ever crops its head back up. I can almost guarantee uh, we won't because the reaction was so negative. But I would be willing to bet that deep down somewhere there was a team uh, doing some uh, testing, uh, and 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 somehow that made it into a live build, and someone uh, probably got chewed out pretty good. Uh, then there was a kind of a weird little story, and I didn't even know this, but an Astrobot. Uh, there's no Square Enix characters, even though there's a bunch of Square Enix games that are like known as PlayStation games, especially the Final Fantasy games, uh, and that none of those characters are in Astrobot. And the Astrobot, uh, the the head of their studio, uh, basically deferred the question, but said that they respect the decision of their partners. So it uh, sounds like for whatever reason, Square Enix wasn't willing to license out their characters to be in that game. Um, I mean, that's weird, but. Square Enix, like I said before, is making like multiple moves to kind of, it seems like, get away from being like what a lot of people would call like a Sony second party studio um, because of how many of their games come out as exclusives on that platform, um, at least for a time. So kind of an interesting one there. And then Nintendo doing more Nintendo things. Uh, The Ryu Jinx emulator uh, has been shut down reportedly by Nintendo. So yet another emulator that flew too close to the sun and Nintendo said, nope, (laughs) said, no, 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 you will not be doing that. Um, It is Nintendo is such an interesting company where like half of the company makes these this beloved hardware and has all these beloved ips and makes all these games that people love and will defend to the grave and then the other half of the company is the most old school grumpy lawsuit happy just litigation machine that is like borderline like it does some like arguably kind of evil stuff. Like if you ever look at how they handle uh, like smash brother tournament companies and stuff like that like like Nintendo obviously loves their fans uh, and, and, and especially in ways that makes them money and freaking hates their fans in ways that don't make them money. It's they are a very curious company and uh, we'll, we'll have to see. I'm still hoping 
that that lawsuit they have against power world i hope they fail i, I hope they don't make it um the the things that they're trying to copyright or um or or, or make exclusive um you know basic game mechanics and and stuff uh that shouldn't be defended that that is bad and they should feel bad so we'll have to wait and see what happens there uh, moving on to non uh, main gaming platform news uh this has probably been a long time coming given the news of the last year or two um but it's still kind of crazy to read but supposedly reportedly the guillermo family uh is considering selling ubisoft uh and and specifically selling ubisoft to tencent um, i believe tencent currently has a like 49.9 percent stake and the the Guillermo uh, company, which is what owns uh, Ubisoft, uh, so I assume they're basically one and the same. Uh, and it seems like, for whatever reason, they are looking to get out of the game. Uh, no pun intended. Um, that I guess there's also a possibility from the report I read is that they could just go private instead. Um, to to I guess the the two things are either they'll sell the ten cent and remain a publicly traded company or they will go private and come off the public trade market um, and probably still end up selling to somebody. Uh, I would guess that's a personal speculation. Um, this is scary. Uh, I, I wouldn't blame uh, every single Ubisoft uh, studio member to be terrified about this. Um, because as we know, when acquisitions happen, uh, it is a sure bet that layoffs are coming after that. And, it, you know, I, I think I talked about it last week or recently that Ubisoft has like 45 plus studios and like 25,000 employees. Um, the only reason it's like that is because it's owned by like the same people who founded it. Um, there is zero doubt in my mind if someone else takes over Ubisoft, they will cut that studio number in half and I I will, it will be rough. I suspect we'll see that employee count drop, probably not in half. I, I think they'll try to move people. They'll probably, one of the things about Ubisoft from what I've gathered is that uh, they have their like big studios. They have a few and then they have a lot of smaller studios. So they might have like five to 10, like traditionally large studios like Ubisoft Massive, Montreal uh, and a few others. And then they have like a bunch of like satellite studios that I suspect are much smaller uh, and likely employ a lot of contractors and things like that. My guess is that they would consolidate studios and, and, and make more studios bigger than currently but have a lot fewer small studios if any um what one of the things about it and and why we're probably going down this road um I, i've seen a lot of people being like oh they don't make any good games and stuff like they do and they make games that actually sell pretty well um but the the thing is and one criticism i forget who it was someone said something like well they just release a bunch of crap they don't i mean maybe they do that's subjective but like they don't release much. Uh, if you think about a a publisher with twenty five thousand employees and uh, you know forty plus studios, uh, they they release like a game or two a year. Like they don't have that much output, and I I suspect that's probably the biggest issue. Um, I don't know. Uh, this is I, I like Ubisoft. Um, I really pretty much just like the division at this point i mean i'm okay with far cry um i hope they get back to making rainbow six games i care about i hope they get the ghost recon franchise back in a state that i care about again because i haven't basically since future soldier um same with rainbow six with you know vegas i haven't really cared about that franchise since then um you know, there's this supposed Splinter Cell game, this remake coming. There's supposedly this Prince of Persia stuff happening. Like, you know, we just have to wait and find out. Um, but I don't want to see Ubisoft go down. Um, the potential of them being bought by Tencent. Uh, the thing with Tencent is that they just have like minority stakes in so many studios that they don't really seem to influence. They seem to just be the money people and, and reap those rewards. Um, I personally don't know of, of studios and publishers that they run um, and how that has gone. Um, I, I don't 
I, I just don't know. I don't know if they're like more evil or, 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 or run things worse than say like an EA or Activision before the acquisition or Xbox or PlayStation or Nintendo. Like, I don't know if they're better or worse than those places. Um, but, but more than anything, you know, a big acquisition like this or a big purchase like this, uh, a transfer of power is pretty much always bad for the people who work there. Um, as someone who really wants to see a, the division three, who wants to see some of those other franchises continue on, um, this, this news it's, I mean, it's probably not good. You know, I, I hope it's not going to be bad or I hope it's not going to be as bad as it can be. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think you're going to find a lot of people out there being like, great. I hope Tencent owns Ubisoft. I, I don't know. We'll um, got shaky cam there. Um, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that Silent Hill 2, uh, the reviews are out for that remake. Um, and the open critic, it, it was an 88 the last I checked. Um, that's interesting because I was not expecting that one bloober team has kind of a mixed reputation. Um, you know, the games they've made have always been like, okay. Um, and, and I'll tell you the this game Silent Hill Two the remake showed so bad. I thought the trailers for this game looked really awful. Like just looked truly bad. Like I genuinely thought this game was going to be a complete failure that, that it was going to come out and actually deserve a 58 meta open critic score. Um, but it seems like it's earned a much higher one than that and that it's super good. Um, I am, I'm curious, uh, to what this means for that franchise. You know, does this mean that, you know, we're, if it sells well, see, that's the thing. Well, what's so interesting now is, you know, a good open critic score isn't the whole story anymore. Um, you know, if you ever hear stories about back in the day with publishers, you used to reward studios for just straight up the Metacritic score. They would have like a bonus structure where if you hit this Metacritic score or this whatever score, you got this much of a bonus. Uh, and I'm sure that's still a factor. Um, but now it seems like sales are also important where you had games like Hi-Fi Rush uh, get these like crazy high, you know, these really good critical scores and then sell so little they shut the studio down or at least tried to. We'll talk about that. Um, so I, I'm curious to what this means for Silent Hill um, and, and if we'll see more from that. Uh, it's, it seems like Silent Hill 2 is a unique situation where it is just known for being like this, like legendary game uh, in general, but especially in that franchise. And we'll have to see if that carries on. Uh, speaking of Hi-Fi Rush, we have Krafton uh, first talking about how they have signed a deal with the Power World devs uh, to work on a mobile port of Power World. So we'll have to see what comes of that. Uh, and then Tango Gameworks is reportedly working on Hi-Fi Rush 2 uh, off of a build that was about six months old when uh, they got shuttered by Xbox. Um, that's interesting because supposedly their next game was a uh, Tokyo, uh, the what, the Tokyo, um, whatever that game was that they had uh, a sequel to that. Uh, and uh, and then that there was like talks of Hi-Fi Rush 2. But then supposedly they were six months into a build that could mean almost nothing. It could have been a pro prototype being built and stuff like that. Who knows? Um, but that's going to be an interesting saga um, to pay attention to um, for Tango Gameworks. It would be super cool if they work on Hi-Fi Rush 2, uh, put it out. It's like game of the year and everyone, you know, you know, thumbs their nose at Xbox and says, look what you did. Look what you gave up. Um, I... I'm just skeptical of that because, uh, as I've talked about in previous episodes, uh, I don't believe that the issues that caused Xbox to shut down or try to shut down Tango have gone away. Um, and, and I don't think that Crafton as a publisher has more resources or capability than Xbox has to alleviate those issues. But we'll have to wait and see. Um, to me, it just seems like it was just a basically a big PR move. Uh, and they've even come out and said that they don't expect it to make money. And I don't believe them. <laughs> and so we'll uh, we'll have to wait and see. But I, I wish for the best for all of those all of those folks. Uh, speaking of Jason Schreier, again, uh, he talked about a large number of canceled projects uh, from Blizzard. 
uh, on the MinMax podcast uh, while he's promoting his new book about Blizzard. Um, he's also he's just basically spilling the beans with Blizzard, unlike their entire history of people who worked there and were fired and went on to um, gain a lot of notoriety either in other industries or in the gaming industry. Um, talking about all these games that cancel a bunch of shooters and all this. Uh, from this also came some speculation or rumor that um, Blizzard is straight up working on a new shooter game of some type. Uh, it, it's not you know super specific about what that may be. Uh, I'll, I'll be curious. Uh, Blizzard um, it seems like they've gotten um, you know they're, they're, they're kind of house in order a little bit. Uh, one thing to consider is that, you know, they're going to spend the next, you know, ABK, Activision Blizzard King is going to spend the next like three or four years integrating or being integrated into Microsoft. And, uh, you know, you still see it with Bethesda Zenimax that um, I assume they're mostly combined at this point, but it seems like they still aren't completely, you know, the part of the Tango Gameworks uh, shutdown, the Arcane Austin shutdown, um, as well as a couple of other studios, uh, what were likely them completing plans that were planned by Bethesda Zenimax. Uh, and, and that was a while ago that that acquisition happened. Uh, but those, those things happen gradually and they, and they, and they, they take a long time, um, you know, save a, a big change in the industry or, or something or the fortune uh, of the company. So I'll be really curious to how this plays out um, and how the acquisition, all that changes projects and, and who makes them and all that. Uh, and I'm sure Jason will write another book. I mean, he's almost certainly going to write a book one day about the ABK acquisition and everything that happened as it was going through. And then afterwards, I'll be, I'll be curious to hear other people talk about that book. <laughs> uh, Larian's uh, Sven Vinky uh, suggested that their next game will probably come out in 2028 or 2029. Uh, that is quite far away, uh, but that's not that surprising when you look at how long Baldur's Gate 3 took to develop. Um, that would be interesting because Baldur's Gate 3 spent, you know, about three, I think maybe a little more than three years in early access. Uh, if they're shooting for 2028, that would suggest potentially uh, they could open up early access in a game as early as 2025, maybe 2026, uh, if they go and do the same thing they did before. I, I'll i be curious uh, because... What they did with Baldur's Gate 3 is uh, I remember hearing about Baldur's Gate 3 and, and about its early access and people talking about playing it. Um, but there wasn't a ton of hype behind it. Uh, if they do early access this time, especially if it takes two, three plus years um, because of the notoriety they have now, it will get way more attention and way more people will be in there. And that may not be good. Like that could be bad for them because people are going to treat it like a new game. Um, and I assume, and I could be wrong, let me know if I am, that people had a decent amount of patience with Baldur's Gate 3 as they were iterating and doing the early access thing. Um, but uh, that they won't get that again. And so that actually makes me think they won't do early access, but we'll have to wait and see. So... I'll be really curious, you know, whatever they come out with next it is going to be big, whether it's good or not. <laughs> they, they they made a arguably once in a generation or maybe once ever type of game with Baldur's Gate 3, a game that I will not say is perfect. Uh, and I think sometimes it gets a little, a little overhyped in that way. But it's just a the thing about Baldur's Gate 3 for me is that there's no one thing about it that is like 10 out of 10. I mean, maybe, I don't know. But it's the fact that uh, and a lot of games are like that, right? Like there's a lot of games where like parts of the game are nine out of 10 and then other parts aren't as good. I think what's unique about Baldur's Gate 3 is that it does so much and it does basically all of it at a higher level than maybe any other game I've ever played. Um, so yeah, maybe it's not a 10 out of 10, but we're most games say you have 10 categories you would score a game on and most games maybe get like an eight or a nine and two or three categories and then other categories are lower because of reality because no game is perfect Baldur's gate three for me probably would be like an eight and up in every category and i think that's why it has the status it does and that's going to be really hard to follow up on and honestly to a point 
while I would have loved for them to do a DLC or Baldur's Gate 4, which supposedly they started working on and then shuttered it because their heart wasn't in it. And that will break my heart forever. <laughs> um, it would have been so hard to live up to that game. And to a point, I don't think that's why they're avoiding it. That's I think they really just probably feel burnt out by making Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, so they want to do something different. But uh, I wish they would have. But that's okay. I'll, I'll still be excited. And then Star Citizen, uh, the Star Citizen Studio Imperium Games, a mind you, a game that has raised like over half a billion dollars for development over the years, uh, has mandated a seven day a week schedule uh, for people to come in and work to prepare for Citizen Con uh, that's happening on October 19th. I didn't know they have a con <laughs> like I know there's some like diehard Star Citizen fans uh, and that there's people who really enjoy it and will like really preach it's it what it is um but like what like come on <laughs> like th that's insane one to make your people crunch like that two that they have a, a a convention supposedly i guess and that they're making people work like that for a convention that outside of their circle you know, someone like me who I think I'm, I'm generally knowledgeable about games. I didn't even know this existed. Um, strange, weird, not, not great, not a great look. Um, I, I think we would probably not like to hear about all of the different companies that have instituted a thing like this more to release a game and not be in like year 10 of development on a game. Um, that probably isn't releasing for another five or 10 years. Um, but man, people are gonna keep giving them money though. They got those whales out there. I'm uh, moving on to some content updates. Uh, Dragon Age the Veil Guard is coming out later this month. Uh, my uh, plan for content for that is to uh, stream it. Um, I'm taking off that whole week for other reasons, but also to play it and stream. Um, I uh, plan on streaming it the day it comes out and as much as I can after that, uh, I, I will make a review. I'll do other types of videos if I feel inspired to do those. Um, I have put in for an early access code and like a review code for the game. So if that happens and we're allowed to say that we um, are reviewing it, I will do that. So keep an eye on either this podcast or my social media or my discord. Um, I have touched base with a few devs to see if we could do interviews after the game comes out and I can talk to some folks about it and uh, get some people from Bioware or even some voice actors and stuff would be really fun um, to chat with uh, about that. And um, yeah, that, that's the plan for Veilguard. Uh, a week after the Veilguard comes out, we have N7 Day. So if you've been around for the last few years, you'll know I get really excited for N7 Day. Um, if with better or worse results, we'll have to wait and see this year. Um, my plan for in seven day this year is uh, some point this month and the next week or two to do a solo podcast, uh, speculating about what we may or may not get for this uh, in seven day. Um, and then kind of talking maybe a little bit more about where I think, uh, how I think Dragon Age is going to influence and kind of maybe some timelines that we'll talk about some of that stuff. Um, on the day of, on N7 day, on November 11, uh, 7th, I will um, be streaming, I assume, a good chunk of that day. I'll probably either just be hanging out or playing some Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Uh, but uh, I believe at 12 o'clock Eastern time at noon, uh, at least the current schedule, is for myself and N7 Legend to join Kala Elizabeth on stream and either talk about if the reveals have come by that time, talk about those, or to just kind of shoot the crap about, you know, Mass Effect and probably talk about Dragon Age as well. Um, and then after in seven day, um, I'll do all of my coverage videos. Hopefully we get a bunch of stuff that I can dissect and speculate on and I can do a bunch of that like I did. More so two years ago, the 2022 in seven day had so much stuff to speculate on with like concept art and all that. Uh, 2023 kind of just had that trailer, uh, really. Um, I'll cover all that stuff. I'll talk about my feelings about it in general, the whole N7 day, and then more than likely do a follow-up podcast uh, with N7 Legend as we have in previous years uh, to kind of you know debrief on, on it and kind of see where we're at. Um, I am planning on reaching out uh, for to Bioware for that as well to see if I can get 
literally anyone connected the Mass Effect on the podcast to uh, obviously probably not talk much about that, that next game, but to just talk about, you know, the, the history of Mass Effect and, you know, kind of how people are feeling about things and all that. So that's my plan for content here coming up. As you can see, the studios kind of coming together, you know, not studio, really my my backdrop uh, there. There are lots of other things I still want to do with the whole space. As you've seen the shaky cam during uh, this episode, I want to try to get a better solution for that kind of stuff. But uh, we're, we're, we're taking it one day at a time here. We are uh, we are working on it and um, I want to keep continuing to um improve things and um i really appreciate you uh being here and uh continuing to enjoy uh you know this 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 thing i do 304 305 episodes of it now and that is where i'm gonna wrap it up uh thank you so much for watching this episode of the bonfire gaming podcast uh, please check out all the things in all the places, share the things in all the places. And uh, that's what I have for this one. So until next time.